Okay, so thank you very much, Matteo, for the, for the invitation. I'm excited to be here um, and see what's going on on the EU institutional communication front. Um, but at the same time, I have too many slides, so I'm gonna hop right into it and try to keep this to 25 minutes. Um, and talk to you about social media, Euroscepticism, and the European public sphere. But I thought it might be too early in the morning for graphs and figures, we'll, we'll get to that. But I wanna start with, uh, we can call it a mental espresso of sorts. And I thought it'd be easy on the eyes to start with this beautiful fresco, because we are in Italy, and some of you may know it. It's called The School of Athens by Raphael. It's considered one of the masterpieces of Renaissance art. It sits in the Vatican, and it is meant to symbolize philosophy. And the perfect perspective here draws our attention to two philosophers, Plato pointing to the sky and Aristotle reaching out towards the ground. And if you look above that painting, you'll see this picture. And on these blue uh, banners here, you'll see in Latin, causarum cognitio, the knowledge of causes. Because ancient Greek philosophy was, as a sort of predecessor to modern science, was trying to understand the root causes of things that happen in the world, right? First order causes. How do we make sense of what's happening in our environment and our universe? But I think what's happened is there's been sort of a shift to what we could call reactinum cognitio. I think my Latin's right, so maybe one of you Italians can, can correct me on the, uh, the uh, declensions, but the knowledge of reactions, right? We're so interested in trying to find out what's driving engagement on social media. You know this as communicators. What's driving likes? What's driving shares? Um, is it positivity, negativity? Is it the time of day you post? So instead of looking at kind of the reasons why people are engaging with your content, we tend to think more about what's driving reactions and not getting to those really root causes about what are people concerned about and what's driving them to engage on social media. And I think we've also had this happening in the social sciences where we have this knowledge of reactions, people trying to figure out what's going on. So if we look at things like the rise of the far right or dissatisfaction with the EU or conversations, and here I'm talking big conversations, things like the Me Too movement that are really salient in our public discourse, we see these reactions and then we tend to categorize them, right? And this is how our brains work. If you think about how we have the animal kingdom, right? We have mammals and birds and reptiles. We like to categorize things and put them in boxes in order to make order out of chaos. So if we look at this kind of knowledge of reactions, we have the rise of the far right, and we call that populist. We have EU dissatisfaction, and we call that Eurosceptic. Or we see these conversations, and we call them public spheres. And I'm okay with that. I think that's how our brains work, right? We categorize things. The problem is when we turn those categorizations, those labels, into causes. I'm gonna walk you through some examples to sort of illustrate my argument here. If you look at the literature on European populism, it's only about 15, 20 years old. Scholars saw this rise of far-right parties and they saw some similarities between them. They kind of disregarded the differences, but they looked at the similarities and they said, this is, these, these are populists. Their, char their charisma, their strong leadership, what these leaders share, what these parties share, is a populist way of doing things. And that's okay. But when you start to attribute populism or the rise of far-right parties to populism, you're taking a category and you're making it a cause. So you see the rise of the far right, you call it populist, and then you try to explain populism by making a theory of populism. So I'm gonna walk through some more examples to illustrate this argument. You have the rise of EU dissatisfaction after Maastricht, after EU enlargement, and we label them, we say, those are Euroskeptics. And then we try to develop a theory of Euroskepticism to explain the Euroskeptics. So you see the rise of Euroskeptics, we call them Euroskeptics, and we develop a theory to explain the very thing that we drew the observation out of, right? Take conversations. We have conversations in taverns and coffee houses, right? The classic Habermas public sphere. We see conversations happening, we call it a public sphere, and then we develop public sphere theory to explain conversations. It's a circular logic. So, if you were to take the animal kingdom example, you'd say, look, there's all these different species of mammals and birds and reptiles. But you can't develop a theory and say animal kingdom, the animal kingdom explains different species. That's what's going on in the literature. It's a sort of circular log logic that doesn't quite make sense to me. 
I'm going to illustrate this more as we go along. But the problem is when you start attributing these kind of empty concepts to giving them explanatory power. So The Guardian did a big piece on populism and, and charting it out. And you know, one of the premier academics working on this says, there is no doubt that populism explains, and then goes on to list populist parties. So the, the argument is, there is no doubt that populism explains populist parties. You see what I mean? Look at this uh, recent study in a, in a top academic journal. We examine why Euroscepticism drives populist voting. This type of language drives me nuts. Because there's deeper causes than what we're looking at. Remember, trying to get to this idea of ground truth, a first order cause. So if we look at, you know, here's what we think is causing these reactions, but there's deeper problems, there's deeper causes. Rising inequality, sensationalist media, economic globalization, increased immigration, technological change. These are complex issues that explain not just these causes, but also the reactions. So I think we should study the deeper cause and not these empty causes. And the problem, the danger, I think, I'm okay with labeling populist and Eurosceptic, whatever, but I hate when I see it in the media and in public discourse because what you're doing when you're using those terms or you hear those terms is you're simplifying complex problems, which is exactly what the populists are said to do, right? And when you use those type of words, that reinforces the populist narrative and it adds fuel to the fire. So I just wanted to encourage you to think about that. That's my uh, mental espresso for the morning, how to get your brains working. And I wanna go back to our uh, two famous philosophers here, Plato with his hand up. His philosophy was very much focused on um, saying that everything we see in the world is a representation of something more perfect in the heavens, right? That's where I think these concepts belong. Aristotle, with his hand out, was more focused on what's out there in the world, right? What about empirics? Show me the data. He was obviously one of the, uh, the first philosophers to introduce a scientific method. So let's see how some of these concepts hold up to scientific rigor. Euroscepticism, very simply put, critique against the EU or its policies, right? Academics tried to nuance this very famous classification between hard and soft Euroscepticism. Hard Euroscepticism being the idea that, you know, you're absolutely opposed to the EU. No way ever will you allow it to work. Soft Euroscepticism is this kind of idea that you're critical of the EU, but you're open to some kind of reform. So it's a very broad category. And two decades after this um, conceptualization was made, the author came out and basically said, there's still problems with soft Euroscepticism because it's too broad. It captures too much. So a couple scholars, uh, one of them a colleague of mine, tried to categorize Euroscepticism into more uh, nuanced categories. And this is a little bit hard to read. But basically, you can be positive or negative towards the principle of immigration. We're better working together. And then from there, you can be positive or negative about the EU's institutional setup. On the other hand, you can be positive or negative about how the process is going. And the point I want to illustrate here is that if you follow these positive, negative decision trees, basically, you'll end up with six different categories. If you're all positive, you have affirmative European. If everything's negative, you're an anti-European or a hard Euroskeptic. And then you have these other categories in between that try to give some more categorization, some more labeling to those uh, Euroskeptic, the soft Euroskeptic category. And what they did is they, they took this typology, this categorization, and they looked at some conversations online around the 2009 European Parliament elections. So they looked at national uh, online news sites and blogs, and they looked at transnational social media. So they looked at Twitter hashtags and Facebook pages and groups very early on. And they basically categorized when, when there were statements about the EU, were they positive or negative, and then about what? The institutional setup, the principle, or the project of integration. And you'll see, the pro-Europeans are the highest at, at 15% here. There's a caveat to that. But if you look at the soft Eurosceptic category, it's about 20% of the data. The hard Eurosceptics were about 7%. But the interesting part is that there's a group called diffuse Eurosceptic, which is over half of the data, 60%. These are statements that were about the EU, but couldn't be put into any of those boxes. So if you just say EU sucks, you don't know where to put that in these categorizations, but that's how a lot of people feel, right? So you have this 
people just, they don't even know sometimes why they're against the EU, they just are. And my argument is, we don't try to explain that by focusing on Euroscepticism, this idea that doesn't actually happen in real life, but we need to understand what's driving the sentiment or the cause behind that Euroscepticism. So I don't actually think Euroscepticism is very useful, but we can look at what are the drivers of Euroscepticism in a different way. So the findings of that study were that the minority of online discussions around the EU had an argument. So most did not have a spelled out argument, and therefore there can't be this type of deliberative public sphere as Habermas envisioned, right? And then um, there was a divide. So a lot of the pro-European arguments were by journalists and people involved with politics. And they were the ones that spelled out the arguments, whereas citizens were this diffuse type of Eurosceptic, uh, usually around the democratic deficit. I'm gonna skip this in the interest of time. I'll talk a little bit about the European public sphere, which most academics agree does not exist. But there was a lot of hope around social media, right? Twitter, Facebook, bringing in a European public sphere, a space where people could discuss about issues relating to the whole of Europe. But of course, Europe is super complex. There's a lot of linguistic uh, barriers there. But a colleague and I wrote a, wrote a chapter a few years ago where we were thinking like, what's the difference between Twitter and Facebook and which one's more likely to be a European public sphere? And what we argued is that even though, even if you had citizens that wanted to engage in European-wide discussions, you could never have a European public sphere because you couldn't close off the border. People from the US could comment on European affairs, people from Brazil. And we weren't thinking about this at the time, but this is exactly what happened with this information. You can't wall off a European public sphere. You could try with IP addresses, but people could VPN. So the, I, the whole point of social media is that it's transnational to the point that there are no borders. So anyone could join a European public sphere or corrupt it. We also argued in that paper that even if you had a closed off perfect European public sphere on social media, let's look at the demographics of who's on social media. For Twitter, it's mostly the United States. The first European country is the United Kingdom with 14% of its population on Twitter. The next European country is Spain with 6% and then it goes down from there. So if you had only Europeans participating in a European public sphere on Twitter, you would have what we call an Anglo-Saxon bias where you have um, majority Anglo-Saxon Anglo countries that are engaged in the conversation. We know that the UK public tends to be quite Eurosceptic, so we would have a Eurosceptic bias. And I also know from, from my own research that these Eurosceptics in Britain are the most active during elections um, and, and plebiscites, such as Brexit. So even if you had a public sphere, this beautiful public sphere, it would be dominated by Eurosceptics from the UK. So just more uh, ammunition against that. But you know, like, <laughs> the, the point of academia is not to tear down concepts. So we, have, um, we don't have a European public sphere, but we can think about to what extent are public spheres Europeanized. So this gives us this idea of Europeanization. And this comes from the, uh, the international relations literature, and it basically argues um, that you can look at policies at the European and the member state level and see to what extent do member state policies fit the European framework? To what extent are they Europeanized? So you can take that policy line of thinking and apply it to national debates, and the idea is that European, uh, National debates can be Europeanized. And what that looks like is you have European issues and actors that are visible, right? It has to be salient. You have fellow Europeans that are mentioned. So national debates are referencing what's happening in other countries, and they're discussing common themes. So instead of a Twitter bubble public sphere, what you have is the Europeanization of national public spheres, where within each member state, people are discussing common issues and referencing other countries in Europe. So a colleague and I were watching the 2014 European Parliament elections where we're gonna have the rising tide of Euroscepticism, an earthquake, a virus, tidal wave, all these fun metaphors. And we thought, well, this is something that people are talking about across the EU. Other member states are mentioned. What could it be that contestation about the EU is actually driving a Europeanization process within member states? So we just published this article, uh, you can check it out, it's up on my, um, pinned up on my Twitter page, or I'll happy to send you the, uh, the link. Very long title, and I'm probably running well on time, so I'll, I'll, I'll move a bit quickly through it, but our research question was, 
to what extent does national media discourses about Euroscepticism, to what extent are they Europeanized? And then what explains that? So the idea is that we were not trying to study Euroscepticism, we were trying to study how the media reports about it and see whether that indicates a Europeanization of public spheres. Spoiler, it does. So the data, we took six countries' mainstream media. Uh, they differ along uh, their media systems, whether they have a successful Eurosceptic party and their relationship to the EU budget. I think it's interesting for you. I'll talk about that uh, in a second. And we took all the mainstream media articles from 2014, European Parliament election year. We tried to get two tabloids and two broadsheets per country. And we basically, and these databases are so bad, so we couldn't do that. That's a problem with the study. But we basically searched for all media articles in these countries that mentioned Euroskeptic, Euroskepticism, or similar words that dealt with the concept. Here's the breakdown of the articles. Interesting that the UK is actually quite low. They don't talk about Euroskepticism so much. I'll skip this, and I'll show you what we did. This is a technique called topic modeling. And you basically feed the articles into a machine, and you read them by columns, like this. So it basically generates topics across large amounts of data. So if you look at this topic over here, this is uh, data from the UK. And this topic is about Scottish independence, right? So it basically statistically finds word co-occurrences in documents. It gives you topics. So that's a national topic. Here we have a European topic. It's about European politics, nation states, policies, economies. So it's a, it's a, it's a European discussion. This was about a national debate between Nick Clegg and Nigel Farage. So this is a national issue for the UK. And then here we have another European issue. This is the kind of rise of the Euroskeptic narrative. This is uh, mentioning different countries, talking about Euroscepticism, Le Pen, far right, these type of things. So what we did is we basically labeled all of these to see whether they were national or European. And we looked at the different countries. And we find that media articles mentioning Euroscepticism tend to be talking about Euroscepticism in a European context with the exception of the UK, so that might not be a big surprise. But then we took these European topics, and we wanted to see which countries were talking about which issues. So we plotted it on this map. You have the different countries here. And if the topic, again, where the word Euroscepticism was mentioned, here are the topics. And if there's three countries or more that talked about it, we put it in the middle. And this kind of, for us, shows that Europeanization narrative. So these topics were all discussed in the context of Euroscepticism, and multiple countries were talking about it. So this is that Europeanization of national debate. What's interesting is that we find that the UK isn't talking about the same topics as the rest of Europe, but discussions around European politics, sorry, discussions around British politics, such as the Scottish referendum, create a Europeanization narrative, or they draw one because other countries are all talking about British politics. So I think we see this also in Brexit. People in the UK aren't talking about what's the implication of Brexit for Europe. They're talking about what's the implication of Brexit for the UK. But everyone else is talking about Brexit and what it means for Europe. So it's creating this Europeanized narrative. OK, I know I'm low on time, but we then wanted to decide what factors explain this process. And we thought, well, maybe the type of news outlet does. If it's a tabloid or a quality press, does that affect to what extent Euroscepticism is national or European. So we, we hypothesized that broadsheets, high quality journalism, when they discussed Euroskeptic discourse, it would be in a European way, not a national way. Turns out true. We thought if the country doesn't have a Euroskeptic party, it's gonna talk about Euroscepticism as a European phenomenon because they don't have it in the domestic context. Yes? And the most interesting, I think, for you guys is that we looked at whether the country was a net receiver or contributor to the EU budget. And we thought that if the country is getting funds from the EU, it's going to talk about Euroscepticism as something out there, something European. Boom. Turns out that's the case. So the findings was that we found evidence that there's a Europeanized discourse around Euroscepticism. National media outlets drive this process. And macro level structural conditions, such as the type of newspaper, the constellation of the party system, and the country's relationship to the EU budget influence to what extent Euroscepticism is discussed as a European or national phenomenon. So to go back to my argument of cause and reactions, we could have said Euroscepticism causes the Europeanization of public spheres. But instead, we looked a bit deeper, and we found that the media type, the political system, and the country's relationship to the EU budget are actually the drivers of Europeanization 
to get at a deeper cause. And I think that's a uh, plus one for Aristotle and the scientific method. So I didn't talk too much about social media, although it was in the title. Um, I think the main thing is that we know the mainstream media still set the agenda. So even though we studied newspapers, we're pretty sure that that um, reporting influenced the conversations on social media. But if you do want to find out more about it, there is the podcast. Thank you for mentioning it. I've also done a podcast um, around speakers of the Europecom Europe conference. And uh, both Aristotle and Plato agree that it's fun to listen to. So thank you.